Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Yeah. Sing, show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. you take your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I had a guy uh, try to sell me a casket the other day. And so I told him, that's the last thing I need. Y'all like that one. You liked it. That's good. Uh, I probably attend more funerals than most everybody in this room. And it is a, a sad time, there's no doubt about that, it's a sorrowful time. But what I have found is that there is a difference between the funeral of a lost person and the funeral of a saved person. Uh, there is a difference, because with one, there is no hope, and with the other, there is hope even in the midst of death. I've titled the message, Hope in Death, and I want to show you from our passage today how Paul brought encouragement to the church in Thessalonica concerning those who named the name of Jesus who had died. No doubt, Paul had talked about Jesus coming back. No doubt, he had talked about some end-time things, and they were expecting Jesus to come back. Paul himself was expecting Jesus to return any moment. And so, in that, people began to die. And the Thessalonians were concerned about that, and Paul said, I'm going to speak to that. And he does so here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 13. Let me read that verse, and we'll get going. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. First of all, hope in death is found in explanation. It's found in explanation. He says there, I don't want you to be uninformed, and therefore I'm going to explain it to you, hoping that that explanation will lead to not a sense of dread or a sense of grief, but it will lead to a sense of encouragement. Now, there are a couple things at play here that you need to note. First of all, the uninformed are hopeless. The uninformed are hopeless. If they don't know the truth about what happens when you die, about what happens to the soul and the body, about, about Jesus coming back, about all those things. If they don't know that, if we're uninformed, even believers, when they face that funeral, will have great discouragement and will be hopeless. We will act just like non-believers act. That's what it says here, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. The uninformed are hopeless. The unbelieving are hopeless. Notice it says there, you will not grieve like the rest, all those who do not believe in Jesus, who have no hope. For those who do not know Jesus, there is no eternity in heaven. For those who do not know Jesus, there is only hell. For those who do not know Jesus, death is the final enemy. For those who do not know Jesus, death is the end. For those who do not know Jesus, they are hopeless when it comes to death, and that hopelessness in death leads to a hopelessness in life. Not only those who don't believe in Jesus, but those who might have a religious belief of some sort, 
yet that religious belief that puts out there a belief about the afterlife, but if it's not based on Jesus, then it is wrong, and even those who do have some type of belief are hopeless as well, because in the end, it is empty, it is vain, it is worthless, because it is not true. Those unbelieving are hopeless. Those unwilling are hopeless. Those unwilling, these are those who do not want to face this reality. They do not want to face the reality that without Jesus, all we have is hell. They do not want to face that reality. So when they are at a funeral and they look in that casket there at the front and they see grandma there or grandpa or aunt or uncle or cousin or someone whom they know is without Jesus Christ, they will say, at least they're in a better place. They will see, well, they're not suffering anymore. And I will sit on stage, and I will be in my chair with my suit and my tie on. And grandchildren will come up and will say that. And children will come up and will say that. And friends will come up and they will say that. And I will have a smile on my face because I'm supposed to be a good preacher. And I sit there smiling. But on the inside, I'm thinking to myself when they say that this heathen who never accepted Christ, who never lived for Jesus, uh, who is sitting in this casket, when they say at least he's in a better place, at least he's not suffering anymore, I do like this and I think to myself, maybe. Because the reality is, without Jesus, all you have is hell. You see, for those who believe and trust in Jesus, this earthly existence is as close to hell as we're going to get. For those who do not know Jesus and they die, this earthly existence is as close to heaven as they're going to get. And if they die without Jesus... They may not be suffering here anymore, but they're suffering even worse in a place called hell. They are not going to a better place. They're going to a worse place. And trying to fool ourselves into believing otherwise leads to a hopelessness and a foolishness. I will never preach somebody into heaven because I don't know if they're saved or not. I will say things like, if they gave their life to Jesus Christ, this is true. But I, you will not find this preacher getting up saying, I know that so-and-so is in a better place. You know why I'm not going to say that? Because I don't know. But I do know this. If they've never named the name of Jesus, if they've never accepted Christ, if they've never placed their faith in Him, my friends, they are not going to a better place they are not going to be out of their misery and their turmoil. They are not going to be better off. They are not going to be watching from heaven hoping you do good. They are going to be in hell and in misery and in darkness and in burning fire that never is quenched. I heard a story about a man who died, and he was a scallywag heathen. He was uh, without Jesus completely. And he had a brother who was very wealthy. And the brother put in the paper and made it known throughout the community that he would pay $20,000 to any preacher that would preach his funeral and call him a saint. Well, he went to the Presbyterian preacher, and the Presbyterian preacher said, No, I'm not willing to do that. And he went to the Methodist preacher, and the Methodist preacher said, Nope, I'm not willing to do that. And he went to the Baptist preacher, and the Baptist preacher said, Okay, I'll do it. And on that day, the building was full of people. They were all gathered around to watch what the preacher was going to say. They knew he had never named the name of Jesus. They knew he was one of the worst men in town. They knew that that man was not a saint, and they wanted to see if the preacher was going to say so. And they had the testimonies and the eulogies and the songs, and then it was time for the preacher to step up. And the preacher stood up, and he buttoned his coat, and he stepped up behind the pulpit, and he said, We all know that this man was a saint compared to his brother. <laughs> the 
The reality is, without Jesus, there is no hope. Without Jesus, there's no hope in the next life. There's no hope in this life. But as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I want you to know that death is not the end. It is just graduation day. Death is not the end. It is not the enemy. Jesus has already given victory over sin and death. And when we face that final day, we can do so with hope because we're informed on what's really taking place. Well, let's talk about that, preacher. All right, verse 14. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Hope in death is found in example. It's found in example. Notice he says, If... And the grammatical construction there is, if and we do, if we believe and we do believe this, that Jesus died and rose again. Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the dead is the core tenet of biblical Christianity. Without that, we have nothing. Without that, there is no hope. Without that, there is no forgiveness. Without that, we have nothing. In fact, the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. There are a whole host of things that we can believe about Jesus, but it is his resurrection from the dead that is in the core of a gospel response to the good news of Jesus Christ. And so if we believe that, if we truly believe that, then this other truth will be true, and it's that truth that gives us hope. Look at what he says. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, the same exact thing will happen, that we die and will be raised again through Jesus. And how is that? God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. If we believe that Jesus died and was raised again, we identify with him, we can expect the same. Let me give you a few passages of Scripture. Uh, we find in Colossians 2.12, says there, when you were buried with him in baptism, in other words, when you died to yourself and gave your life to Christ, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 6 and verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. There is an expectation in Scripture that those who die with Jesus will be raised with Jesus. There's an expectation of a resurrection from the dead. Here, Paul is writing and says that that is part of our hope. And he explains how this happens. In general, then specifically, God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. Those who are falling asleep through Jesus, these are those uh, who have died in Jesus Christ. And it says that God himself, not he will raise them, he will bring them. Well, what do you mean he'll bring them? Well, when we say we're going to bring something, what does that mean? That means that we grab it and we bring it along. He is going to bring them with him. The him there is not God, it is Jesus. Jesus is going to be going somewhere and when Jesus is going somewhere, God is going to come and bring those who have died with him. And that's how they're going to be raised from the dead. Now, again, we don't have clarity on that. He's going to continue in a minute. But we can see that Jesus is our example, and we will reflect the example that he's given us. How many of you like to do puzzles at home? Let's see. Show of hands. How many of you like puzzles? Oh, man, we like puzzles. Uh, now, when you put your puzzle together, do you turn it? to where the only thing you can see are the cardboard backs of the puzzle pieces, and then you put the puzzle piece together based on the cardboard back, and then you say, oh, look how glorious this is. You turn it over, and you did a great job. Do you all build it that way? You don't do that. So you turn it the, the puzzle pieces to where the picture is on the top, 
and you put the picture together, and that's how the puzzle gets together. But how do you know what the picture is supposed to look like? On the box is the completed picture of the puzzle. And so you will grab a piece and say, well, that's a red piece. Where on this picture on this box is a red? And if you do the puzzle right, the puzzle that you finish will end up looking like the example that was put in front of you. If Jesus is our example, the promise is we eventually will end up looking like the example. The example is not one of death and misery. The example is one of death and resurrection. He being our example means that we too will experience, if we die, we will experience that resurrection. And so we have his example, is hope in death. And then keep reading. Well, let me do this first. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 23. This is going to be a bunch of reading, but you're going to like it. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Whew, the bottom line is this. If Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, we have no hope. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, and we can just go home and not even look at the Bible anymore. That's what he says. So my friends, if Jesus was raised, you're going to be raised if you identify with Christ. Let's move to the third thing. Look there in verse 15. There are some questions here that we want to ask. How does this work? Verse 15, For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now I'm going to disappoint some of you. Some of you have studied these end-time things, and you've got an idea of what's going on. Paul does not give us all of the details of what happens with this event. Not in this passage, anyways. And so, the reason that he has given this is to encourage the church about those who have died, not to give them an exhaustive knowledge of this day. So let's look at it through that lens. He says, first of all, well, let me give you the point so that you OCD people don't have a problem today. Hope in death is found in expectation. It's found in expectation. He says there in verse 15, We say this to you by a word from the Lord. This is something that Jesus taught. And in general he said, We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 4, tells us about this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if not, I would have told you, I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. He says there that I am returning. And the end result of that return is that you will be with me also. Notice it doesn't say where that is, just that you're going to be with him. And frankly, I don't care where that is as long as I'm with Jesus. And so we, we have this promise that he's going to come back. And he says it again, at the Lord's coming. Uh, the word here is parousia. If you want to take notes in English, it's P-A-R 
O-U-S-I-A, parousia. It means from the person's perspective who is receiving, it means to come or to arrive. Someone's coming or someone's arrival. It was used generally in the New Testament. Once it's refused, used of Titus, one of Paul's co-workers, when he came from a journey and he arrived, he came to Paul. It was his coming and it encouraged Paul. It is used in this Greco-Roman world to refer to the state visit of a, an official, in particular the Caesar, the king of the Romans. When he would come into a city, it was his parousia, it was his coming, it was an official state visit. In this text, we have an official state visit, not from the king in Rome, but from the king in heaven. It says that Jesus is going to visit, he's going to come at his parousia. And it says, at his parousia, when he shows up, the Bible says in verse 15, we are, who are still alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Those who have died in Christ will be first at his parousia. How does that work? Well, he gives us some details in the next few verses in verse 16. For the Lord himself at his parousia will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. There will be a shout, and a voice, and a trumpet. Do you know how the Caesars would show up in town? They would show up with a declaration, and a voice, and a trumpet, letting people know that the Caesar is on his way. Then it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I have no idea how this is going to happen. Think about this for a minute. When someone dies, their soul is removed from their body. That body can be buried. In many places, they are buried facing the east, so that when Jesus comes back, the Bible says he's going to come back from the east, when they are resurrected, they can just sit up and be looking right at Jesus. Well, what happens if somebody didn't get that memo and you're buried facing the West? Maybe you're buried upside down. Maybe you've been buried at sea. Maybe you've been cremated. How in the world does God bring the soul and reunite it with the body? I do not know how that is going to happen. All I know is it's going to happen. And when that happens, the body that's going to be raised is not going to be this old aged body. It's not going to be this body that's hurting and got pain and got problems. It's going to be the perfect body that God has for us, the resurrection body that he has for us, the eternal body that he has for us. That is what we will be resurrected in. God will do that. He will bring those people. He will usher them along with Jesus as Jesus arrives. Join us next week for the conclusion of the message, Hope and Death, by Pastor James Pritchard. Here is a preview of next week's broadcast. What it's saying is when we, when our body dies, our soul is separated from our body, and it says that it is with the Lord. We take our last breath here, and our next breath is in heaven. Bible says that God, Jesus is the right hand of God in heaven. We will be with him. So when a Christian, when a believer dies, they don't die. They just graduate to another realm of being. They are alive with him spiritually. There is a current reality for those who die in Jesus. They are in heaven with him. They're talking. They're hanging out. Who knows what else they're doing, but I know they're awake and they're with Jesus and they're waiting the day when the trumpet of the Lord will sound and Jesus will come back and they'll be resurrecting their body and they'll be with him forever. The important part of this entire passage is not the time, it's not the way, it is not the who, it is the fact that at the end of the day, we will be with Jesus. Well, thank you for joining us on our broadcast today. I want to share with you the most important aspect of the message today, and that is our response 
to the loving message of a loving God. I want you to know that God created us to have a loving relationship with Him. And we mess that up when we sin against God. We are all sinners, the Bible says, and we all fall short of His glory and His standard and His expectation. And when we fall short in that way, we are separated from God, and we're separated spiritually now, but if we die physically in that separation, we will be separated forever in a place called hell. The Bible teaches that God looked down at us, and He said that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us because He loved us, and He wanted a restored relationship, and He wanted us in heaven with Him after we die. And so He sent Jesus to die on the cross. He sent His only Son. Jesus lived a sinless life. He did not deserve to die, but He died on the cross to take our place and to pay for our sins. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so, as we recognize that we're a sinner, and we believe in Jesus, that God sent him to die for us, and we are willing to commit our life to Jesus Christ, he will come into our life and save us. And I want you to know that right where you are, wherever that is, you can pray and call out on Jesus to come into your life and to save you. In fact, if you're wanting to do that, I invite you to pray with me now. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I cannot get to heaven on my own. I believe you're God's son, that you died on the cross for me, that you were raised on the third day. I surrender my life to you, and in the best way I know how, I will follow you. Will you come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and save me? Thank you for saving me. Amen. Well, I would encourage you to find a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church wherever you live. And if you're in the Lafayette area, why don't you come visit us at First Baptist Lafayette. God bless. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org.